A hundred times a day, I remind myself that my inner and outer life are based on the labors of others, living and dead. And then I must exert myself in order to give in the same measure as I have received and am still receiving. Albert Einstein. Hey there, welcome to the Retirement Answer Man Show. My name is Roger Whitney. I'm excited you're here with me today. (laughs) I feel like a robot. Hey, I'm excited you're here. This is the show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement, but have the confidence, the confidence to rock retirement. And it's a little hard to have confidence at the moment. I woke up the other day and saw that the markets were continuing their downswing and we're pretty much in bear market territory, which is defined as a market that has gone down 20% from its high. Lost about 20% of our money in stocks. And this has been a little bit more brutal than others in the sense that if you have a bond portfolio, which you likely do as part of your investment allocations, it's gone down a lot as well. So we're getting the one-two punch, which is not a good thing. So it's hard to have confidence. Unless you have a process that you work consistently and you've structured things, the expectation that these types of times will come, and that's really essential. The end of this month, this is a five-week month, and I know we're talking about legacy for the month, but the last episode on the 29th of June We'll take a break from the legacy talk and we'll talk about bear markets and spend time answering your questions. So if you have questions related to bad markets, you can go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger and we'll try to answer them on the show at the end of the month. And we have a bunch of other questions to get to as well. Today, we're going to talk about leaving a legacy in a non-financial way. So let's get going with this show. And also, we're going to answer some of your questions in our Q&A segment. Today's show is sponsored by Boomer Benefits. They speak Medicare. If you're facing a Medicare decision, Boomer Benefits is a great resource to go to to help you navigate your Medicare choices based on your situation. The cool thing is that they are essentially free to you in that the Medicare system provides four services like this. So whether you use someone or not, you're paying the same amount. And when we have a client in our practice that has to navigate a Medicare decision, this is who we turn to. So check them out at boomerbenefits.com forward slash R-A-M to get your Medicare decision right. So we've been talking about what a legacy is and how to leave financial legacies. Now let's talk about how do we leave non-financial legacies. And so what is the objective when we're leaving a non-financial legacy? I'm going to be honest with you. This is where the game is. Money is great. Money can help fuel somebody. What do they say about money? Money doesn't change people. It just accentuates who they are, their character, the kind of person that they are. I think that's really true. But money isn't the true legacy. And if we think about history, where does it come from? It comes from stories. Stories were the original historical record. A story passed on about a great feat or a big trial that someone or a group of people had, and the results in that story would be passed on from generation to generation. You may have a story in your family that is part of the legacy of your family. I think of my grandfather who was a tail gunner in a B-17 in World War II, newly married to my grandmother, had just had my mother, and he was in Europe having to fly, I think it was like 50 missions. He flies 50 missions, or I don't know if it was 25 or 50, then he got to go home. And imagine, young guy, just got married, just had his first daughter, off to war to fly in B-17s, which had a very high mortality rate. And he kept a journal, a very like, here are the facts journal of every single mission, which we have. And that's a treasured history of ours. And he volunteered for every single mission he could do. He wasn't overseas that long. 
because he would volunteer for every mission because his whole goal is I just got to get home as quick as possible because I have these obligations to my family. That is a legacy that I hold and I tell to my kids. I show them the, the notebook. I show them his papers. I show them his purple heart to my daughter and my son. And they know that they're going to get this. And they have that story that they can tell about their great grandfather that they never knew how his sense of obligation to his family was so important to him. This is what he did. You may have a story like that in your life. That is the objective when we're talking about non-financial legacy. Now, two things come up when I'm thinking about the objective of what we're trying to do here. One is this idea of an exemplar. So an exemplar is a, you know, the definition of it. Let's look at it. It is one that serves as a role model or example, an ideal model, a typical or standard specimen. That is what we, you, me, should serve as not just for our family, but for our friends and for the world. Now, that's a pretty high standard, isn't it? I don't feel like an exemplar in much. I may have my moments. You're always going to have a huge gap of what you could be and who you are every single day. But one of the objectives of a non-financial legacy is always trying to be intentional in closing that gap. Knowing that you're going to fall down and skin your knees and sometimes face plant over and over again. That's okay. That's the human condition. And every day you're creating a postcard of your life, that postcard for the day. So being an exemplar is a great way to leave a legacy because how do people learn? I mean, it's no different for adults than it is children, right? A child learns to speak by listening to their, watching the parents and their siblings and those around them. They learn to walk. They learn how to treat a spouse or how to treat friends. They learn how to manage money, usually by who they watch and they emulate. And sometimes they'll learn, maybe they were emulated poorly because they had the wrong roll of the dice, parent or network-wise, and some still evolve. You can learn from others, but that may set them back. So you being an exemplar is probably one of the best non-financial legacies you can create. So that's the big objective. The second word that comes to mind is encourage. Think of this word courage. It comes from the 1300s. Heart, hence spirit, temperament, state of mind. Courage is in great need right now. And so I think a second objective in the non-financial realm of legacy is to help people have courage to lean into their life. I take this as one of my life's callings. It wasn't something I sat down and thought about. It's something that was a process to figure out, is to encourage others. Now, what does encourage mean? Well, it comes from an old French word. It means to make strong or put in. So essentially, encourage is to help put in courage to someone else. That's pretty cool. So I think from a non-financial standpoint, we should try to be exemplars day in, day out, day in, day out. And we should work to encourage others to help them on their same journey to being their best self. I thought this was a non-financial pod or a financial podcast on huh? this stuff is important. The financial stuff is important and there's ways to use finances to be an exemplar and to encourage others. But if you don't get this part right, the money doesn't matter. We've seen plenty of people get plenty of financial legacy and just be jerks or be horrible stewards with it. And so on the non-financial, this is the foundation for everything. So what are some strategies to achieve these objectives? So when you do pass on financial legacy, that they can be good stewards. They can be non-jerks with it, (laughs) good stewards with the money. And that's the multiplier, right? That's the force multiplier that can change the world and does change the world and puts at bay the opposite forces, of people that aren't good stewards and they don't aren't exemplars. This is the battle that's always going on. And you have a role in it. A book I would recommend in thinking about this is a book called The Power of Moments. And we'll put a link to it in our Six Shot Saturday email, which is every week, by the way, we have an email that we send out Saturday morning where we have a summary of the show. I usually share some things that I think are interesting that might help people on their journey. But we also put links to things that we talk about. So if you're not signed up for that, you can sign up for Six Shot Saturday. Email at sixshotsaturday.com or rogerwhitney.com. And that way you can get that weekly email and 
get lots of resources. Promise not to spam you. But The Power of Moments is a good book. And they talk about when we recall an experience, we tend to remember what they call flagship moments. The peaks, the pits, and the transitions. And it makes total sense. I had to go do a story of my life exercise in this coaching group that I'm in, where I had to tell the story from my life from my first memory to today, the highs, lows, and transitions. It was very uncomfortable, and I could paste together the chronological sequence of things, but there really aren't that many memories. There were some pits of a moment, a conversation, how I interpreted that conversation that in many ways influenced how I view the world. Some were very negative that I had to work through and still battle because it's always there because it imprinted on me. And there are definitely some peaks. I can still remember I was an okay baseball player and I was on a team that was better than I was and we were playing in a big game. Bases were loaded. It was like one out. And I'm at bat and I felt I could tell that everybody's like, oh man, Roger's hitting. That's at least how I interpret it, right? And I get up there, a couple pitches, I half swing on two pitches and it, I was just sinking in my heart. I'm going to strike out here with bases loaded. And then, and I'd look over and the coach would be encouraging, but I didn't see a lot of faith in his look. And then pitch came, I smacked it, hit the fence in center field. It was a double that cleared the bases. I remember that moment. I can close my eyes and remember that peak. I could do that. I remember accomplishing the Ironman. I could do that. We have pits like that too. And then you have the transitions, your marriage, children, retirement. These are moments that we remember, but it's not a lot of data points in our memory. So if you're leaving non-financial legacy, what you have the opportunity to do is observe others, your children, your friends, your spouse, your community, and be aware of when they have a peak or a pit or a transition. And with just a little intentionality, put a mark on it. Accentuate it in a certain way. So as an example, we'll start with a high story. When I was turning 40 many years ago, get a knock on the door. I open the door and there is my friend Eric from Michigan, who I've known since high school. He's my brother from another mother showing up at my door. He had conspired with my wife to show up at my door in Texas. And Shauna had cleared my calendar with Nicole. So I, or I don't know if Nicole's around then, clear my calendar so I could spend two days with my best friend. I had this moment, I was turning. If, I don't know if it's 50 or 40. I think it was, huh, I don't even know. That's how old I'm getting. I had this moment and they highlighted this moment in a unexpected way. And that will be a memory for the rest of my life. He was aware that I had this coming up and he was intentional about putting an exclamation point on it. So that's an opportunity for you when you see peaks for others to just be a little intentional, put an explanation, exclamation, Clamation point on it to help imprint that moment for them. Now, what's the opposite? A pit. We all have pits, don't we? My mom died. That was a pit. My sister died. That was a pit. I've had clients with all sorts of things, all sorts of pits in their life. We have the opportunity for a little bit intentional to help fill in those pits just a little bit. And that is another area where you can create a moment. You can show up in whatever way is needed to help fill in that pit. Now, you can't fit. This isn't fixing anything, but you can be there as an exemplar to encourage them. Just be with them to help get them through a pit. I remember in 2000 when we had the technology crash, markets were horrible. And I was a younger advisor, had just moved to a major firm, and had a family. My wife wasn't working. Kids were young. And it was brutal and a lot of stress on the financial end of things of, okay, how do you get through this? Is this going to continue? Is this the big one? Probably some of the feelings we're having today in the markets. And I remember an older advisor across the hall who had the big office 
called me in there and he was asking me how I'm doing with my family, how business was and everything else, just talking to me. And he offered to essentially throw me some business. He says, you know, you're, you're going to get through this. You're, you're good. You're doing all the right things. But, you know, if you need any assistance financially, I can throw some business your way to help fill the gap, fill in that pit. And I declined. Everything was fine, but I remember that because it was a really low point and he went out of his way to acknowledge it and encourage me and fill it in. In fact, I think it was probably seven years later, I was driving around Dallas because that's where I office at the time. And I looked him up. He was still there. And I called him and I told him the story of that day, which he did not remember. And I just thanked him. He may have forgotten that conversation, but maybe that encouraged him and acknowledged him in that moment. These are examples, right? What about a transition? A transition is a time when you can show up to help someone and encourage them. You know, the one that I think of is a number of years ago, I had a client whose son, mid-30s, not married, no kids, came into my office and we were just chatting about his direction. He had a really good career. And he was from Latin America originally, or his parents were, and he spoke Spanish fluently, and he really wanted to go live in Latin America. But he was so prudent with his money and his career trajectory and everything else, he was always talking himself out of it. But he really wanted to do it. And so while we're talking, I framed it in, and I encouraged him, and I said, why don't you just go do this? This is your time of life. You're not married. You don't have any kids. You're extremely employable. It's obviously a passion for you. Go explore and figure it out. And then he would keep in touch from time to time. And then about six, seven months later, he goes, Roger, I'm living in Latin America. And he found a job where he's bouncing around doing some project management work. And he enrolled. I think he got his MBA down in Latin America, met his spouse. Now they have twin daughters. And he recalled to me maybe a few years ago that conversation in our office. That was a moment that he remembered. Now, I am not responsible for this change in trajectory of his life, but I played a role in it that marked a moment and encouraged him to embrace what they wanted to do. That's how you leave a legacy. How do you elevate moments with your children? Fill in the pits, mark the transitions, celebrate the peaks or with your spouse, or with your friends, or with your community. This is how we leave a legacy. So what are some tactics around this strategy? Well, one is time. You can't manufacture these things. You have to actually walk life with people, even if it's the community, because everybody is going to remember different moments. A peak or a pit for you might be experienced totally different by somebody else. You've got to have time. Another tactical thing is you can pick up the book Giftology or probably even read the summary on the internet. Giftology is a book that talks about intentional gift giving, how you have to think of how the person is going to receive it rather than what you want to give them. Probably the best gift giver I know is Nicole, Nicole Rockstar Mills. She gives great gifts. When I was first awarded the top 100 influential financial advisors, which at the time, it was early in the podcast journey, it was a good affirmation. So it was sort of a big deal of, okay, I'm just doing okay. She sent me a cup that said, Mr. Influential. And over time, she sent me a fountain pen with my word of the year on it. She sent me silly postcards. Most recently, she sent me dish brushes because I was talking about how I dominate the dishes at home and I like agile and they were agile dish brushes. Think of a gift that will mark something for someone else. You don't have any ideas, email Nicole. She's great at it. Celebrate highs intensely. Celebrate highs intensely. That is really hard to do. I have a hard time celebrating intensely. I I, I enjoy it. I give myself an attaboy and then I get, okay, what do I have to fix? What do I have to fix? And we're going to talk about this, I think, a little bit in August. Celebrating intensely is really important. And then fill in the lows by being there, not solving anything, but helping be there because that's what people need. Ultimately, people need to feel important and cared for and paid attention to. 
So those are some ideas. And a good friend of mine, I wish I would have done this when my kids were younger. I don't do it now, which is really no excuse, even though my kids are in my 20s. But he has a journal that he keeps for his daughter. She didn't know about it. It has memories. It has lessons based on his life and her life and observations. And at some point, she is going to own this journal written in his hand. So there are a lot of tactical things you can do, but think about moments. And with that, let's get on to answering some of your questions. Next week, we're going to talk about how do we put all this together to create a legacy strategy. If you have a question for the show, you can go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger and leave an audio question or even type in a question. Love to get questions and we try to answer as many as we can on the show. So our first question comes from Suzanne. She says, all of my retirement savings is in traditional IRAs, no Roth, but I learned that as a sole proprietor, I could set up a 401k for my employee, me, and put in post-tax earnings into a Roth without traditional limits on income and a much higher contribution limit. And so she wants to know, how does that work? And so some background on Suzanne, because she, she wrote a lot more, is she is recently retired, congratulations, and now is doing some consulting. And now that you have this income, Suzanne, and you're correct that you can use a solo 401k in certain instances, which is also called an individual 401k, to essentially have your own employer retirement plan. And it's a simplified version of the standard 401k that you have, you know, maybe at your corporation that you retired from that is able to be used for certain individuals. So let's talk about some of the basics of individual 401ks, Suzanne. And there are a variety of providers that will do this structure for you. And typically there's an annual fee because there's some very basic regulatory forms that have to be provided. So in order to establish a solo or an individual 401k, you have to, well, be as it sounds. You cannot have any other employees. As soon as you have employee number two, employee number one being yourself, then you're no longer eligible for a solo 401k. And we'll talk about other options there. I believe, and I haven't looked at this in a while, that one exception to that is if your spouse works for you. I think then that falls under the individual 401k, but you'd want to navigate that. And the advantage of an individual 401k is that it's going to have a lot of the same feature as the traditional 401k. One, you can do the maximum employee contribution, and you can do that as a Roth option if you set up that account. And as you stated, I think in your email, this is something that you're wanting to do is try to build up some Roth dollars. So if you contribute your employee contributions under the Roth option, that's going to avoid any income limits that apply to say Roth IRA contribution. So as an example for 2022, the current contribution limit to a 401k for an employee is $20,500. And if you're over age 50, you get to add on an extra $6,500. So in theory, Suzanne, you could put $27,000 as a Roth contribution if you were to set up a individual 401k and had that option selected. Now, the second contribution that goes into a 401k, an individual 401k, is the employer match, which you can have as well. That will always go in pre-tax. So you'll end up having, let's say you did your 27,000 Roth contribution to the individual 401k. You would also have a pre-tax match based on your income. Generally, it's three to 4% of whatever your income is up to a certain limit. That will always go in as pre-tax. And that portion would be deductible as a business expense because you're contributing to the employee, the employee being yourself in this case. Oftentimes, with high earners that have solo 401ks, you can attach a profit sharing plan as well to the 401k, which will allow you potentially to get up to the limit of what's allowed to go into a defined benefit plan, which I believe this year is about $61,000 as well. And that's all going to be based off of your income. So whenever you're talking about a 401k, you have the employee contribution. That's the part that could potentially be a Roth contribution. 
and then you have the employer match, and then you have an optional profit sharing contribution that can happen basically at the discretion of the owner. So I think a 401k solo could be a good idea. I think the setup and annual maintenance, I'm going to say it's right around $1,000. And there are all in packages. I'm not sure of providers at the moment, but you can Google that and find those. Now, other self-employed options are going to be, let me pull up this because I have a handy calculator to recommend to you as well, is if you're self-employed or have a small business, and let's say you have employees, you could set up a SEP account, which is an old school, it's an SEP IRA. So it sort of falls under that IRA tagline where you could have a maximum contribution of up to 61000 You could also set up a simple IRA plan, which is a very simplified employer benefit plan. And these are, you know, the SEP would be one that you might use as a sole proprietor. And what you'd want to do is look at the structure of your business. Is it an LLC or is it a sole proprietor? Look at the age. And then you can actually calculate which one might give you the best benefit based on your income level. And I'll refer you to a calculator here in a second. And then if you have employees, you can do a simple IRA plan. The limits are a lot lower. You can't do Roth, but you can provide a very simplified version of a retirement plan in the event that you have employees. I know this isn't your situation, Suzanne, but there might be others. And then if you do have employees and you want all the bells and features of Roth contributions for employee contributions and matching contributions, you can do what's called a safe harbor 401k. That's actually what I have in my business because I have two employees and they're not family. So we have a safe harbor, which is a simplified version of a 401k. And the costs are a lot less expensive than your standard 401k. So Suzanne, if you're self-employed, I think an individual 401k is a good option if you want to try to get Roth dollars into that. Now, a website you can go to, which is run by a census, which is one of the largest record keepers in the country for retirement plans is individualk.com. You can learn about individual 401ks. They have a calculator where you can input the type of business you have, your expected profit, and it'll actually show you a comparison of how much you can put into an SEP versus an individual 401k. But for a self-employed person, I think you're right, Suzanne, if you want to contribute Roth dollars, then the individual K is going to be the one that would likely give you that option. One add-on thought here too, Suzanne, is if you establish an individual 401k and bring in your outside IRA dollars into that, that might allow you to do backdoor Roth contributions and avoid that pro rata rule. So something to consider and talk to your tax advisor about. So hopefully that gives you some guidance for you, Suzanne, and anybody else that's working after full-time work as a consultant or independent contractor. Our next question comes from Anonymous. Hey, Anonymous, how you doing? And this is regards to I-bonds. Anonymous says, I'm looking to not only purchase, but also redemption when it comes to I-bonds. Would it be better to have one I-bond for 10000 or more than, or purchase various amounts that equal 10000 My thinking is that if I have smaller amounts and I need to redeem one earlier, I only need to redeem what I need rather than the entire amount. But also, hopefully, it's a 10-year plus proposition. So essentially, the question from Anonymous is, if I purchase I-bonds, should I just buy one 10,000 bond or should I buy a lot of individual ones? And so for everybody listening out there, you may have heard about I-bonds. They're sort of the cool thing right now because inflation is high and they have an inflation adjustment from a yield perspective. So an I-bond is issued directly by the U.S. Treasury. You can go to treasurydirect.gov, and it has an interest rate and an inflation adjustment, which determines the interest that you receive. And because inflation has been rising, the inflation adjustment has been pretty high. And so right now, if you were to purchase one for at least the first six months, you're going to be earning, I don't know what it is, around 7%. That's pretty cool right now. And then you are required to hold them for a year. And then if you sell them within the first five years, you lose, I think it's 60 days interest. So it can't go, it doesn't go up in value or down in value. You're not going to lose any money and you're not going to make any money other than the interest that it pays you. We've had some series on this, but you can check it out at treasurydirect.gov. 
Well, Anonymous, you're in luck. So if you just go ahead and buy $10,000 worth of I-bonds, which is the annual limit for a person, so if you're married, you could do it for each of you, when you go to redeem, you can redeem any portion. You can redeem the entire $10,000 or you can do it within $25 increments. So you have some options there. In fact, I just remembered it's actually 90 days interest if it's sold within the first year. It just came into my head. So you don't have to worry about this issue, Anonymous. And anybody else out there, when you're going to redeem, it can be in $25 increments. So no big worries there. Two quick little side notes on I-bonds. One is realize they only accrue interest for 30 years, just like the double E bonds, the savings bonds that I still have some for my kids. I have to look at those. So they only earn interest for 30 years and you can set beneficiaries on those so they can buy bass probate. So that's just two little add-ons there, Anonymous. Hopefully that helps you on your journey. Our next question comes from Scott and it's related to a 401k plan and Roth conversion. So let's take a listen. Hi, Roger. My name is Scott. I have a question about Roth conversions during the early gap years of retirement. As a small business owner, my 401k will close when my ownership of the business ends. I'm wondering if I need to be concerned with how the pro rata rule might affect the Roth conversions that I would like to do between retirement and RMDs. I heard a professional pundit say that upon retiring, you want to avoid rolling pre-tax 401k assets into a traditional IRA so that you don't jumble them into your IRA mix and thereby cause the pro rata rule to apply to any Roth conversion dollars. Now, I know you have to pay the tax at some point, and I'm pretty confident the pro rata rule would never lead to double taxation. So is there an optimal way to do this, or is it a non-issue? Thanks. Well, that's a great question, Scott, and I'm going to make the assumption that your small business is going to close down and you are the sole owner. If you have a business that will continue on, because you have other owners and you're just simply leaving the business, that 401k may allow you to keep that money in there indefinitely. So you'll want to check on that. But I'll make the assumption from the way that you worded it that this 401k would close down when your business closed down. So when it comes to the pro rata rule and Roth conversions, it only comes into play if you have after-tax contributions in your IRAs. Because when you do a conversion or a partial conversion of a Roth, the IRS is going to look at the mix of pre-tax contributions and earnings and post-tax contributions. And if you have post-tax contributions, it's going to do a formula to assure that you're not having double taxation on the conversion. So the first point, and this might be the easiest one, Scott, is if you don't have post-tax contributions in your IRA, this is a moot point. Because you can put all the money into an IRA and do whatever conversions you want and the pro rata rule won't come into play because it's all pre-tax money. So that's might have solved your problem right there because it's not often that we see post-tax contributions in IRA. Now, if you do have post-tax contributions and you're wanting to manage that, then yes, having your monies in a 401k when you're calculating the pro rata rule for Roth conversions won't be counted because it's only going to look at IRA money. And so your options, well, you got a couple of options and it really depends on your circumstance. So number one, you could step down significantly your business and keep it a shell and maybe coordinate with your CPA to keep the business, or maybe it's an LLC, active for a couple of years with nominal to, I don't know how long you can have it, as a business with no income, but that would be something you could check with your CPA and that might buy you a year or two to have no income and still have these assets in the 401k before regulatory wise, you're supposed to shut it down. So I would check with your CPA on this. Another would be is to simply just slow down the business significantly and have some nominal income just to be able to keep the 401k and keep that business quote unquote open and on the books. So that's an option that would help you segregate that money. Another would be, and I don't know if this is really what you're looking for, you could go to a job and move money into the new 401k. And if you would actually prefer to close the business down, another option would be is to close the business down. And only if you're planning on doing some consulting, and literally it could be like 10 grand a year, you could open up a solo 401k, see the answer to the first question, 
move your current business 401k into that solo 401k just to keep it out of IRA. But again, Scott, none of this matters if you don't have any post-tax contributions in your IRAs where you're trying to navigate this pro rata rule. So hopefully that gives you some guidance. You'll want to understand the rules though on how and when you have to close down that uh, 401k for your business. And congratulations, a business is a, a big thing to build and it's a baby. So hopefully that transition's running smoothly for you. Our last question for today comes from Kathy in regards to functional health motivation. She says she's been listening to the podcast for nearly two years and appreciates it. You're welcome. Glad you're here. She knows she has some trouble areas that she's identified from the show, like Irma surcharges on health care and et cetera. But she said, similarly, last month's topic on functional health is a potential trouble area for us. As a non-sporty couple, both 66, how do we add exercise-like activities to our life where none currently exist? Fear of not traveling or our current reward of years isn't a good motivator. Some people don't habitually save for retirement, yet that's what we did. Some people don't habitually exercise, yet they know they should. We don't. You know, as I'm reading this question, I may have answered this one before, and if I did, I'm sorry. But we'll answer it again because I want to make sure that Kathy gets some motivation here. She says, I can't wrap my head around this. As I said, fear isn't a good motivator. What do you recommend instead? Thank you, Kathy in California. It's a great question, Kathy. We all have things that we sort of know we should do and we don't really ever get around to it. We don't integrate it into our life. And we've talked recently about this idea of a trajectory. So think of your trajectory health-wise, Kathy. When you think of your movement, your flexibility, your energy, based on your current habits. Because your current habits create this trajectory. If you're not maintaining muscle, maintaining flexibility and stability, and eating better, then you're going to be on a certain trajectory. And you can forecast out in your head what that might look like. Now, that's sort of the fear end of it. I am much more about becoming the next version of your better self. And so I would suggest reading a book called Tiny Habits, or you could even go on and watch, like there's a YouTube video. If you Google YouTube Tiny Habits, you'll probably find it. And my suggestion would be, whether it's eating, exercising, strength, or stretching, start really small. And we may have a series on how to build habits. But you want to attach what you would like to do, Kathy, to a cue, like you brush your teeth every morning. So that's the cue. It's something that already is in your life that you do without even thinking about it. And then you want to attach the new thing that you do to the thing that you do every day. So let's take the example of I brush my teeth and then you attach the new habit. Every time I brush my teeth, I touch my toes twice or once. And you want to make this new habit really, really, really easy. Say you wanted to exercise, and this is an example you use in the book. It's better to say, I drive home from work. When I pass the gym, I stop. And the first habit might be putting on my workout clothes and walking inside without even doing anything. That's the bar that you have to jump. And then when you drive by the gym, you walk in. Even just walking into the gym could be the first habit. And when you walk in, you celebrate and you celebrate intensely. Yes, awesome, that's like me. That's the way that you can do this in a positive way. Attach, find a cue, something you do every day. I think in the Tiny Habits book and in the YouTube TED Talk, whenever he goes to the bathroom, he does one push-up and he celebrates. And you can see him talk about that. Not see him go to the bathroom, but see him celebrate that. But what will happen is if you make the new habits so easy... It's just easy to do one more over time. So check that out and try that, Kathy. And we'll have some more talk about this actually in August when we're going to talk about how to live a heroic retirement. On your marks, get set. And we're off to set a little baby step you can take in the next seven days, not just to rock retirement, but rock life. So over the next seven days, in the theme of this non-financial legacy, I want to encourage you to listen to somebody with full presence. That's it. Put the phone down. Actually, put it out of the room. If your daughter, your spouse, a friend, 
somebody is communicating to you, make them the center of your world and listen with full presence. You know what today is? Today is the day. What is the postcard for your day going to look like? The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and does not guarantee future results. All indices are unmanaged and cannot be invested in directly. Make sure you consult your legal, tax, or financial advisor before making any decisions. Now, you know what today is? Today is the day. Go make it a great one.